Good morning and welcome back to Morning Movie News. I was off last week because I was at VidCon and I had a great time meeting some of you on Saturday. Now as for today's Morning Movie News, the first story is about The Accountant and I was so happy to see uh, the news of the sequel get so much attention yesterday. It's the number one article on a lot of trade websites, industry trade websites. It trended on Twitter. Uh, in, a, in a joking way, as people came up with hilarious sequel names, but still, people were paying attention. And I've been a champion of The Accountant since it came out, and I was blown away by how good the film was. And in fact, it has given me great joy to help many of you discover The Accountant. I've had many of you tweet me and say, Grace, I watched The Accountant because you had such great things to say about it again and again and again at every opportunity, so I tried it. And I loved it. So I'm so glad that you enjoyed it as much as I did. And now we're all getting a sequel. So if you've been a holdout, by the way, and you still haven't watched it, well, now you have no excuse because you're going to want to watch this sequel. And when you watch the film, the first film, you will see that it screams out for a sequel because it's very much an origin story. And I think they have so, so much great material to explore going forward, uh, where uh, Ben Affleck's accountant can really go to town. I don't want to give anything away in case you haven't seen the movie, but it ends on a fabulous note. Now, what's also great is that it looks like they're going to bring the team, you know, get the gang back together, right? Gavin O'Connor, the director, is in talks to return, as is uh, Bill Dubuque, the screenwriter. Great screenplay. Uh, ben Affleck, of course. Uh, and then they said they also expect John Bernthal to return. The only thing that I find disappointing, and this is so often the case, which I think is a real problem, is that the actress uh, in the group usually is not brought back. Uh, you know, they're like, let's get it. You know, that's the rotating role, which I think is a shame because not only, I think, does it speak to the lack of importance of the female role, right? They're like, oh, who cares if that actress returns? I think that's kind of sucky, right? But also Anna Kendrick was so wonderfully cast in the first film. Such a great choice, such a, like, um, a great contrast to Ben Affleck, you know, not the type of actress who would usually be put in a role like that. Uh, and so I, I thought that she was a very important part of why that movie worked. And I would like to see her come back, at least in some capacity. I think like uh, Julia Stiles in the Bourne films is like the only person I've seen come back uh, you know, consistently, maybe Joan Allen too, right, in the, in the first couple of ones. Uh, but, you know, it's very frustrating. Even, for instance, in another Ben Affleck situation, on a slight side note here, when they were like, let's get the Gone Girl team back together, Dave Fincher, Ben Affleck, um, uh, Jillian Flynn, right, that's the, uh, the screenwriter, the, the author's name there. They're like, oh, we're going to get the team back together. But there was no talk of Rosamund Pike returning. And I was like, if you don't think that she was really important as to why Gone Girl worked, you're mistaken. Uh, so anyway, I hope that Anna Kendrick uh, is brought back as well. Now, the movie must be doing well. People are like, why would they bring the accountant back? People who still haven't seen it and don't understand how amazing it is. I know there's like a small group of you who have watched it and go, Grace, I just don't agree with you. I don't like it. But, you know, not everybody likes everything. Most people really like this movie. It's so good. We'll talk about that in just a second. We you know why I think it's important and something that people didn't quite understand about the first movie, which is unfortunate. But anyway... It must have done well on streaming. We've talked about movies being discovered after it's in a theater, right? Like, for instance, the most one of the most famous versions of that is Austin Powers. Very small first box office for the first film. So many people discovered it on television, streaming, etc. Um, you know, at that time, you know, DVDs, rentals. That the sequel was not only greenlit, but it was a huge hit. You know, it was a blockbuster. You know, a, a huge blockbuster success. So, um, so anyway, I think that. The Accountant must be doing very well on streaming. And in fact, when it first debuted, it was on the top of the charts on iTunes for, for a while. So uh, I'm really glad that people are discovering that movie. And it's an expensive film. So basically, what this gives Ben Affleck is his John Wick, his Jack Reacher, his The Equalizer, Denzel Washington's film. You know, taken to some degree with Liam Neeson, although I think Liam Neeson is done with those. Jackie Chan just came out with his own. The trailer did very well yesterday for The Foreigner. So well that I've just upgraded it to something I think should be seen in theaters because I think it might be a big hit, which is very exciting, which just shows you how popular this formula is. People just aren't getting tired of it. But what's unique about Ben Affleck's and makes his really stand out from the crowd is that he, of course, is playing an autistic 
assassin. And a lot of people, when the movie came out, a lot of people, like critics in the media, so they thought that was ridiculous that an autistic guy would be an assassin. And it wasn't respectful to like the autistic community. And it was just such a Hollywood joke. And they treated it as such. But I think what they didn't understand, and I think this is very much to the movie's credit, is that it was a realistic autistic assassin. And it took the, just like Ben Affleck's character's father hoped, took the negative aspects of autism and, and used them in a way that they could, became positives. And you know, if, if, when life, when life gives, gives you lemons, you become a lemonade assassin, right? <laughs> you squirt that juice in the other guy's eye, you rub it in the paper cuts and it becomes a plus. Uh, I just, you know, all joking aside, I think that's a great message, right? That just because you've been saddled with something that isn't going to go away, you know, you can't get rid of autism. It doesn't mean you can't harness it and do not only and, and become a, an individual who is really, you know, admirable. He's one of those admirable assassins, um, and and really a high achiever. I just think that's great. I really loved it. I love that he was such a high functioning autistic person who was very cool. And I think that's also a really great thing to show. You know, to have people who are autistic, and there are some other great surprises in the movie as well on the same vein, um, to see to see that and be like, oh look, I'm the hero of the movie. I am, uh, you know, high functioning. You know, uh, you know, this this character took the problems that I struggle with and made them positive. I'm not saying that other autistic people should become assassins, but varying degrees, people, right? I just think it's fabulous. I just love it so much. It also had a, has amazing action sequences, and, the, and Fernando Chen, who was the stunt coordinator and fight choreographer, actually commented on my review. It was so wonderful, so I appreciated that. Uh, and he did fabulous work. Uh, I hope um, he's uh, uh, maybe they can give him a role, because he's also an actor. That would be great in the sequel. And again, the script by Bill Dubuque, was very, very smart. And in fact, he has become a Warner Brothers guy. He's working on the Nightwing script, I think. And there are a lot of similarities, actually, between The Accountant and Nightwing, so I can see that being a fit. And of course, Warner Brothers is famous, or infamous sometimes, for its loyalty. So it looks like, of course, Ben Affleck's already in the fold, the bringing in Bill Dubuque, maybe Gavin O'Connor um, and John Bernthal, too. And what about Anna Kendrick? Why do you feel about that? Do you want to see her return? And what do you think of the fact that a woman is usually the one who gets replaced? Ah, oh, it's frustrating. All right, so anyway, uh, even in these movies like John Wick and Jack Reacher, they're like, oh, it's just, you know, a revolving door of love interests. All right, all right, let's move on. All right, so anyway, uh, speaking of sequels, The Conjuring 3 has been greenlit. Wow, what a cash cow for Warner Brothers. They worked so hard to get the Ed and Lorraine Warren case files. They worked so hard to secure the rights to that. And it's literally paying off. You know, I'm glad they stayed the course on that, and I'm sure uh, Warner, it's Warner Brothers as well. I'm sure Warner Brothers is is also very happy that they stuck, stayed with it, and they were like, we knew this was going to have huge dividends, and huge dividends it has had. But I think that it's crucial not only that they have these, this great source material, and, the, and it's true, right? Although, you know, you can decide if you believe Edward Lorraine Warren or not, but it gives it that little extra special something as a franchise. But, of course, James Wan has done a fabulous job growing this, you know, cultivating it, making sure it's just right, and, you know, not only directing many of the films himself, but producing them and, and picking talent to continue what's now become a cinematic uni universe, the Conjuring cinematic universe. I mean, look at this. We're approaching the Conjuring 3, right? We've already had one Annabelle movie, which did quite well. Annabelle Creation is coming up, which also looks very good. We're getting a Nun spinoff, and we're getting a Crooked Man spinoff. This is nuts! Uh, but what's interesting is that for The Conjuring 3, I think the big question is James Wan, Wan, by the way, will only produce The Conjuring 3. He's moving on. He's doing Aquaman. He already did Furious 7. I think he's going to want to, I would suspect, go into more blockbusters. Or if he does do any more horror, I think he's going to want to do big budget horror. And I think he's ready. I think he more than did his time. And also, he's not abandoning this stuff. He's still producing it. So I, I, I'm a big James Wan fan. I think he's... Uh, as I've said many a time, I think he's a fabulous uh, creative and business mind, which is a, a, a rare combination. And you can see why it's so important to have those qualities, both of them. But anyway, the big question for The Conjuring 3 is, will Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga return as Ed and Lorraine Warren? I think so. Neither one has anything else to do. Uh, I think they're just going to get paid a lot of money. That's probably what is going to happen. I think that Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga's agents will say, they love doing it, but you know, they're, it's becoming like they're going to be known for it. It's like it's a little nervous for them. And also, you're, you look how big this Conjuring Cinematic Universe is, and you've built that on them. I think they deserve 
some some more money. And I think they do. Uh, you know, not like not, they're not going to get like twenty million dollar paydays because these are low budget movies. But I would probably maybe pay them each. I don't know, maybe five, five each, or maybe I'd even see if I could get away with three. I know that's low, but I'd give them back end. That's what I'd say. And I, I'd say, look at the previous movies. You're going to get money, you know? So that's maybe what I'd do. Three to five with points. I mean, because also, again, well, Patrick Wilson's an Aquaman, so I'd be like, you're already friends with James Wan, so what more do you want out of this? <laughs> and But neither one of them's actually doing that much, so I don't think they have too much room to, to negotiate that hard, right? So that's, I think they're going to make, they're going to make some nice money. Um, and also, I think that they're, not only are the Ed and Lorraine Warren so important to The Conjuring films, because it's their case files, but especially if you've seen The Conjuring 2, and you should, it's very good, uh, their relationship is really beautiful. There's a sequence where Ed uh, Warren, you know, the father has left this family and, you know, they feel bad they haven't had a man in the house in a while. And so, you know, that seems like kind of like not so great on the surface, right? But the way they handled it was so beautiful, and, uh, and they, their father liked Elvis songs, and he, he nothing bad happened to him. He just left them, which is horrible. Uh, you know, he just abandoned his family. Um, but uh, Patrick Wilson's character uh, sings an Elvis song to the family, and he does such a wonderful job. And while he's singing, uh, I also, as I said in my review, though, I was like, this is a little too nice, Patrick Wilson. You're going to leave, too. I wouldn't get these people's hopes up. You should just say, girls, be strong. It's just you. <laughs> um, but Vera Farmiga's uh, Lorraine Warren watches him while he does it from far away, and you could just feel... Both actors did a fabulous job really having you understand the love between this couple. It was really beautiful. I, and I love it. I'm a big fan of these movies. Uh, the screen, the person who's going to be scripting The Conjuring 3, working on it, is David Leslie Johnson. Uh, he's working on Aquaman with James Wan. So I guess James Wan was like, I like you, David Leslie Johnson. Why don't you write The Conjuring 3? But I don't know. This guy's resume is spotty. He did Orphan. You know, that Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio hasn't produced a movie in a while. He's like, I don't win any Oscars like Brad Pitt. Forget it. Although he's had a lot of problems with that uh, scandal, by the way, with uh, the Wolf of Wall Street and the financing. You know, it was actually, I forget the country, but a country in uh, East Asia uh, that was actually kind of stolen from the government. And he was like really seriously questioned for his involvement. So I think that's slowed him down. That's why you haven't seen a lot from Leo. Also, I think when you win an Oscar, he's like, I did it. And then he takes a break. He worked so hard for that Oscar. All right. So anyway, and gave us a wealth of memes. All right. So anyway. Uh, also, Unforgettable, that I believe that's the movie that just came out with um, uh, Catherine, oh my goodness, boy, you know, from Knocked Up, Catherine Heigl, oh boy, does she need to work more, Catherine Heigl and Rosario Dawson, it was okay, I saw it, it was all right, Wrath of the Titans, the Red Riding Hood, another little horror movie with Amanda Seyfried, you might recall, uh, but you probably don't. I wouldn't blame you. And then also a couple of Walking Dead episodes. That's probably his claim to fame right now. He's like, forget that other stuff. I've worked on The Walking Dead. And I'd be like, which episodes? How much of it did you write? I'm having a hard time believing you. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not excited about this guy, but I trust James Wan's ability to spot talent. All right, so the third story of the day is I told you I was going to write Mission Breakout and review it. And write it, I have. And review it, I shall. It's not getting its own video, though because I didn't love it. Oh, I feel horrible. All right, so this, let me walk you through my experience. I loved half of it. So I was at the theme park, I had a wonderful day, but then we were, I, I, could, I couldn't get a, a fast pass for Mission Breakout because I had my meet and greet in the morning. Uh, and, so I, and so I couldn't get one, they were out by the time we got to the park and I didn't want to make the people I went with wait on this huge line for Mission Breakout, right? So I was like, oh, so we parted ways and I was like, okay, I have to go and ride this and I hope I have enough time before the Despicable Me 3 screening tonight at VidCon. So I look at the line uh, board and they're saying, oh, it's 75 minute wait. And I'm like, okay, I can just make it, I can do it. I get there and while I'm walking up, they're having, Groot comes out, adult Groot for a, for a photo uh, meet and greet. And he looks amazing. He looks so good. I was so impressed with the Groot. Uh, and I was like, should I have my picture taken with Groot? And they were like, sorry, this line's been forming for a while. It's full, you can't. And I was like, ah, oh, fine. So I took a picture of just other people with Groot. So then I get to the line and they're like, oh, it's only 55 minutes. And I was like, what? That's amazing. That's just this perfect timing. So I get on the line. I'm standing in the line. I also ran into Sean from the meet and greet again. So hello again, Sean. 
So I'm standing on the line and I love the staging for this ride. I was like, oh, this is so exciting. The building looks great. They had like a wanted poster for Mantis and I thought it was so awesome. Uh, and then we come in to like um, this little area where they have, you know, it used to be the lobby for the Hollywood Terror Hotel, but now they've turned it into the greeting area for the collector's collection. And so I was like, wow, Benicio Del Toro filmed something for this. And then this was the problem. I didn't see it because they rushed me through so fast. The line actually ended up only being I'd say the whole line, like past, even past that area, it took me from the moment I stepped onto the line to when I stepped on the ride itself, just 30 minutes. So I don't know what's going on. I think that the ride, by the way, is super short. It's much shorter than the Tower, shorter than the Tower of Terror ever was, which I kind of had a problem with. So I think that the, they're cycling people through so fast that they, it just it has a huge capacity. And I think they probably could hand out more fast passes throughout the day, but I think they want to make it look like the ride is really popular, so they don't. So mm, so, by, so if you go to Disneyland, try Mission Breakout, even if it seems like it's a long line. I suspect that they are lying to you. But anyway, they rush me through. That's part of the staging. So I didn't see the whole introduction from the collector. I didn't see the little bit with the actors from the film, like Chris Pratt, Zoe Saldana, David Bautista. I was like, wow, that's so great. You guys filmed something for this. I wish I'd seen it. So they usher you into the part where they did the old Twilight Zone introduction with the TV coming to life and Rod Serling comes on screen. But here, Rocket, they had a rocket, I don't want to give too much away, but Rocket Raccoon showed up and I loved it. I was having so much fun. I was like, oh, I missed that part, but this is great. And then they have us go and they, uh, just like they had you go to the basement for the old Tower of Terror, they, they restaged it so it looks like the back of the collector's collection, right? And they did a really good job with like dripping water and green lights. And I was having a really good time. I was like, oh, this is going to be fabulous. But then when I got on the ride itself, it was so short, like such a short experience that it was more about just being dropped up and down. You couldn't really, I mean, it started out really good with something with Rocket, which I thought was awesome. But then like you couldn't really hear the music because it was, you know, the something about Rocket talking and like the sound of the ride and the screaming. The music was hard to hear, so it didn't really make a difference what song you got. Uh, and then also, before in the Tower of Terror, when the, when the doors opened to the floor, you would get a little bit of a story, and they'd be like, oh, come with us, and the character, the ghosts would appear, and you'd be like, oh, this is great. Here, you never stopped moving up and down. So when the doors would open, you would already be moving away, and then the doors would close almost immediately. So you didn't really see anything, and there was no story of a breakout. It was just like quick little gags, like, oh, Drax is in this monster's mouth. Oh, here, the Star-Lord's running across the floor. And you, that's literally all you saw. And it was a lot like the opening credits to Guardians of the Galaxy 2 when they were fighting that monster and Groot was dancing and people just roll out and fight out of frame, right? That's exactly what they did. So I just felt kind of bad that there wasn't more of a story. Um, you know, I didn't feel like I interacted with the characters at all, you know? I felt that I was just like, hey, like it was like a drive-by, or in this case, a fall-by, right? But um, so I think that they should slow it way down. And also you can see the line's not that long, there's there's room to make it a longer ride. I, I would say it's probably half the length of a ride of the original, or at least it felt that way, of the original Tower of Terror. All right, so those are the three stories of the day. I have a great viewer question from what shall I do for you? But I, I is spelled like an I. I think that's great. So what shall I do for you? It says, hello, Grace. Greetings from Chicopee, uh, Massachusetts, or Chicopee. Hello. Uh, I'm sure it's Chicopee. <laughs> I'm so bad at pronouncing things. Hello, I'm sorry it took me a week to answer your question, but I loved it. So what shall I do for you says, I figured that you always do an excellent job giving us, your loyal viewers, aw, true insight into world of entertainment on various platforms, that now there should be a very fun, exciting, personal question for you. Aw, thank you. My question is, what lone comic book issue is dearest to your heart? Also, which comic book, graphic novel, or novel short story in general, no matter how obscure or popular it may be, would you personally love to see come to the big or small screen that is yet to be done in its entire entirety or competency? I've been watching you for over four years now, and I love how you've evolved as a person with great knowledge and skills. Aww! And also, this is a question for everybody. I'd be very curious to hear down below your own picks in terms of like a favorite comic, uh, and then also what you'd like to see adapted to the big screen. I'd say like a favorite comic that means a lot to me is probably, um, let's see here, Batman Year One. And also, I really like um, like the Jeff Loeb, Tim Sale, you know, long, Dark Victory and the Long Halloween. I think that's, that's reverse order. It goes Long Halloween, Dark Victory. But those are like some of the earliest Batman comics that I read. And so they mean a lot to me that they really introduced me to the character. So I really like those personally. Now, 
<clears throat> As for what I would like to see adapted, that's easy. Mad love. I'd like to see it done properly because you, you said competency. They really just skim the surface uh, in Suicide Squad. And I would Mad Love is such a fabulous comic and such a unique comic that I would love to see it done right, either as its own movie or as a B, full, full B storyline with flashbacks, flashbacks, et cetera. I would really love to see that. And I would love, because, you know, I think Margot Robbie and Jared Leto would do a very good job with it. I mean, you saw shades of it already, and it was good, especially in the um, <coughs> extended cut of Suicide Squad. But they have to have the abusive relationship aspects there. The ending of Mad Love is so powerful. It's really good. And I would hate to see them try and make it into a girl power situation, you know? And, and, and so I think that all the pieces are there. I would just love, and I think that the interest is there from the fans, which is even more important. And even non, you know, people who only like Harley Quinn and Joker from the movie, you know, from Suicide Squad. So that, you know, their fan base has grown. So I would love to see that story be able to reach such a big audience, but again, it has to be done right. It can't be made cooler, or it can't be made empowering to Harley, Harley, Dr. Harleen Quinzel. Uh, you know, they need to just really take their time, and I think it would be really sexy and, and really intense, and I think also really important in showing, you know, an abusive relationship, and, and you know, and also how how they can really seem like a good, you know, like. You know, but nobody wants to be in an abusive in an abusive relationship, and I think that Mad Love is so well written, and that how the how the Joker is able to you know push and pull and play with and manipulate uh, Harleen Quinzel. It's really really good stuff. And if you haven't read Mad Love, you should read it. And then you too will probably be uh, probably have the same answer. All right, thank you so much for your question. What shall I do for you? Thank you everybody for tuning in today. Please write down below what you think today's top three stories. If you've written, written Mission Breakout, your own thoughts. I know a lot of people love it, so I'd be curious to hear the comparisons. And also, did you ever ride Tower of Terror beforehand? Because maybe you don't have a, the comparison. And then also, of course, the viewer question and your own thoughts on that. All right. Thanks so much for watching, and you can check out some more episodes right now. 